Our scripture reading today is from the book of Psalms, Psalms 115. It's the Psalm of David. This is the word of the Lord. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of a man's hands. They have mouths but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And then to verse 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And may God add His blessing to the reading of His holy word. Today I'm going to start a new series. It will be eight sermons long. I know it says seven spiritual realities, but there's going to be a kind of wrap it up kind of sermon. Whether you are wanting to be a cardiologist or a carpet layer, there are certain fundamentals that you've got to have down pat. The same is true for the spiritual life. There are fundamental realities that you need to understand to have a chance to live a successful Christian life. These seven realities, spiritual realities from Scripture, are these basic fundamentals that you need to know in order to be successful as a Christian. But I need to remind you, Knowing them does not guarantee success any more than passing your driving test guarantees you'll be a successful driver. All it does is legalize the try. These seven realities by design start with God and they end with God. I'm drawing these from some classical Christian literature. You don't find these as a category in Scripture itself. But rather, those with minds much better than mine who have looked at the entirety of the Word of God have recognized these seven truths, these seven realities that are essential in spiritual life. It should be that these start with God and end with God. For after all, the Bible, which is our spiritual guide, is about God. In some denominations, children are required to memorize a catechism, which generally is a series of questions, and they memorize the answers, and they must do this before they can be confirmed or baptized them. Baptized. Now, Baptists, we have historically and traditionally uh, abstained from any kind of catechism or creed. Actually, we have them, we just don't call them that. <laughs> But one of the better known and most loved catechisms is called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it begins with this question. What is the chief end of man? And the answer the child would memorize is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. I really think that's beautiful. What is our purpose? Why are we here? In a nutshell, it is to glorify God. And not just to cast glory upon Him, but to receive from Him, to enjoy Him, and not just in this life, but forever and to all eternity. Well, where do you begin glorifying God and enjoying Him forever? Well, it all starts with this one 
fundamental reality. He's God and you're not. Now that sounds very simple and very obvious, but I'm telling you there's some people that have a hard time getting their mind around that. There are some people who just enjoy playing God. Some people try to play God for everybody in their lives. They know better than anyone else about everything, and it is their way or no other way, and they force their will by the sheer strength of their personality or try to on everyone around them. For most people, though, we simply play God with our own lives. It's our life. We can do with it what we want, and we become our own God. We decide everything. A number of years ago, there was a book that was being pushed through the United Way that spoke about the attitudes of people toward volunteer work. And it was a book about the shape of human character in today's world. This was in the 90s, and I was on the board of the United Way in, in, in um, northeast Mississippi. This book, I found it fascinating, but one section of the book talked specifically about religion. They wanted us to read it because we had to have lots of volunteers, and it was how do you motivate volunteers in today's world. But in the chapter that talked about religion, the writer observed that there was the emerging of a new type of spirituality. Today it's full blown. Then it was just emerging. And this new type of spirituality, uh, he called it Sheilaism. <laughs> now the reason he called it Sheilaism, because to demonstrate everything he was talking about, he did extensive interviews of people. And for this chapter, he interviewed a woman named Sheila. And he talked to her about what she believed. And what she believed was not anything that we might recognize as a uh, mainline or, or traditional Christian doctrine. It was what she had decided she believed. It was Sheilaism. His point was that that was what people were doing. They were forming their own understanding of spiritual truths and considering them absolute. People were being God to themselves. I think we see the result of that on the streets of America today. People being God unto themselves. I listened to a podcast this week, and the podcast was a seminary president, uh, Protestant, and, and the director of a, a Catholic organization called First Things. Two brilliant men and longtime friends. And as they were dialogue, they made the observation, look at the streets of America and look at the violence, the cry for justice, the, the angst, the uneasiness, the anger. And the Catholic priest made the comment, have you ever seen a greater hunger for redemption in all your life? And it is. It's a great cry for redemption. But their doctrine, their way they believe, has it all twisted up. And ultimately... They will not find the redemption they seek. In their doctrine, the original sin is whiteness or white privilege. That's the original sin. And therefore, redemption will be to eliminate every vestige of it, the cancel culture. And if they, even if they are successful, it will not bring the sense of peace and justice, the desire for redemption that they are seeking for. They're making God in their own image. We have to remember, He is God and we are not. And we cannot be. And any time people try to be God to themselves or others, it ends in disaster. You notice in this psalm we read, he's making fun of idols. This is very similar, almost word to word, to a passage in Isaiah where he too makes fun of idols. He talks about these idols. They're silver and gold, the work of men's hand. They have mouths. They can't speak. They have eyes. They can't see. They have ears. They can't hear. They have noses. They can't smell. They have hands. They can't feel. They have feet, but they can't walk. They can't make a sound out of their throat. These idols, these man-made gods are powerless. 
They can't do anything. Thus, if you worship something that is so powerless, then there's going to be a lack of the power of redemption in your life. He's God. We're not. I realized when I did this study that I was able to identify over 300 biblical passages that would support this first reality. And I thought, well, let's make a stab at it. Then I thought better. We'll never get through 300 passages. <laughs> so let me just speak of seven passages to you. First is the text we read, Psalm 115.3. And the verse that was in dark, and some of you caught on, and I didn't remind you to read it with me. That verse says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. That's God. There are no limits upon Him. He can and will do whatever He pleases. You and I want to do whatever pleases us, but often there are constraints that keep us. Thankfully, there are constraints. And sadly, there are constraints. In so many ways in life, we're powerless. But God is not. He can and will and does do whatever pleases Him. The second passage is Job 23.13. The passage says, But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. There's that same statement. Now, is the psalmist quoting Job, or is Job quoting the psalmist? Well, given that Job is perhaps the oldest piece of literature in the Bible, the psalmist is quoting Job here. Job, the writer of Job, has read this psalm and has brought it to his own heart and understands it. He, God, stands alone. You cannot oppose Him. He will and does do whatever He pleases. Job understood that he could not make demands on God. This is in that section of Job where struggling with his friends who are compelling him to confess his sins and to admit he's a sinner and to accept God's punishment and Job doesn't understand. He feels that he's righteous. He feels that what has come to him is unjust, that it is unfair. But he also understood he cannot demand anything of God. God's unique. There's none like him anywhere ever or ever will be. He stands alone. There is no appeal beyond God. None. The third passage is in Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within Him. Now, this is part of a prayer of Daniel. If you remember the story of Daniel, he was sent to King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret the king's dream. But Nebuchadnezzar raised the ante. Not only did he have to interpret it, he had to discover on his own what it was. It was to see who really did have the ability to divine, who really could touch God. And so Daniel goes and he prays and asks God to reveal to him King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and reveal to him the meaning of it. And God does so. This is his prayer. His praise to the name of God. God changes times and seasons. It is God who sets up kings and he deposes them. That's a difficult concept to deal with. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals the hidden things. God knows what is in the darkness. And He Himself is light. The fourth passage is Daniel 4, verses 34 to 35. Now this is not Daniel speaking. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. 
At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, <clears throat> and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? This is Nebuchadnezzar after he was made whole. You see, Nebuchadnezzar tried to claim credit to himself as a divine ruler, as he saw himself, for the acts of God. And so God struck him down insane. He became like an animal. Eventually, God removed that curse from him, and Nebuchadnezzar repented and his sanity was restored. This is part of his prayer. Notice that last phrase, no one can say to him, what have you done? None of us can say that. None of us can question him. Oh yeah, we can raise our questions, but ultimately he stands alone and secure. He's beyond our question. The fifth passage is Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been His counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay Him? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. This is a brief doxology before the end of the book of Romans, but at the end of his presentation of the gospel, how God answers the problem of human sin. In essence, what Paul is saying here, no one could have ever imagined God's plan of salvation. No one could have ever dreamed this up or thought this up. Hollywood would have never come up with this script. But this is what God has done. Oh, the depths of His riches and His wisdom. Who has ever given to God so that He has to repay Him? We sometimes like to pat ourselves on the back saying, look what good I've done for God. What good I've done for the kingdom. With the thought that now maybe God owes me something. God owes you nothing. He wants you to serve Him. He's glad for you to serve Him. But there is never a debt God owes to you. There's only a debt that we owe to God. Then the seventh passage is Revelation 19, 6 and 7. It's a vision of the end of times. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. In this vision of the end of time, John sees clearly. The title of the book is The Revelation. God, John sees clearly God reigns. To be honest with you, there are times in this life where you can't see that clearly. There are times in this life where you wonder what God is doing, where God has done. But usually history slowly reveals God reigns. God reigned on D-Day. He did. God reigned on 9-11. He did. God reigned in Hurricane Katrina. He did. And God is reigning today in the midst of all the chaos of Washington, D.C. God reigns. All of this might be summed up doctrinally as this doctrine. The sovereignty of God. Most of it is a mystery to us. 
we're asked to accept it by faith. God reigns when chaos seems to rule. Thus, when there's chaos in your life, when things seem to be spiraling out of control, it is an act of faith to acknowledge that God reigns. God rules. Another aspect of this fundamental reality is that God is free. We all desire freedom. This country was founded with the ideals of seeking freedom. And the truth is, not all of them, but many of the protesters and rioters in the street are desiring an understanding of freedom, though it is a very limited and very small understanding of freedom. But God alone is really free. We are not. He can do as He pleases. We cannot. One author gave these seven short statements about God's freedom. Number one, God is free to do whatever He wants to do. Number two, God has the right to deal with me any way He chooses. Sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow. Number three, God does not have to treat me the same way he treats my neighbor. Sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow. Number four, God does not have to treat me today the same way he treated me yesterday. Number five, God can answer my prayers any way he chooses, whether I like it or not. Number six, God will not tolerate any rivals to his throne. And number seven, God is not obligated to live up to my expectations of him. And he is not obligated to explain himself to me. Tony Evans, an African-American pastor, says it this way. Everything that happens in life, either God caused it or God allowed it. Ultimately, everything that happens in life goes back to God. He's big enough to handle that. You know, I'm not. I'm afraid a lot of things that have happened in my life and in my family life go back to me and some of those things I don't feel so good about. But that's not the way it is with God. Everything comes back to Him and ultimately He is pleased to act as He has acted and to be as He is toward us. Whenever God, the Bible, speaks of God's sovereignty, I notice the pattern. In almost all the passages that speak strongly about God's sovereignty, they end with praise, or they begin with praise. In other words, understanding God's sovereignty leads to the praise of God. Understanding who God is... And His sovereign will causes us to praise Him, to bow to Him. He does what He pleases. Praise the Lord. No one can oppose Him. Shout for joy to the Lord. Everything God does is right. Hallelujah. His wisdom is unsearchable. To God be the glory forever. His plan is working out perfectly. Praise be to God. God reigns in all things. Let the people rejoice and be glad. So in the light of His sovereignty, the light of the fact that He's God and I'm not, our first reaction should be praise. Thank goodness I'm not God. And thank Him that He is. Our second reaction ought to be, I need God. When I make that statement that He's God and we're not, I'm saying He's Creator and we're His creatures. And we need to never forget that order. He created. He created us. 
The Bible tells us when Lucifer sinned and fell from heaven, his fundamental sin was forgetting who God was and who God was not. Seven times in Isaiah 14, Lucifer says, I will as if he had a divine will to do whatever he wanted, whenever he desired. No one can escape the judgment of God when they try to be God. If you think you can make it to heaven on your own and ignore God's plan for salvation, you're playing God. And you'll be disappointed. He alone is God and you are not. God is complete without you or me. He has chosen to make a way for us to come to Him. There's no emptiness in Him. There's emptiness in me. There's no need that's unmet in Him. I have so many unmet needs. God is perfect in His perfections. I fall short in my imperfections. Thus, when we come to God, there's absolutely no room or place for any pride of self. Because the truth is, God has no need of me. But He wants me. You can know Him and come to Him only because in His sovereignty He made it possible for you to come to Him and know Him. And it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. God does not need me, but I desperately need Him. A number of years ago, we lived in a different town. There was a friend that drove several hours from a previous pastorate to talk to me late one Saturday night. We sat in my little study and he cried great tears of anguish. When he walked in, he said these words, it's over, and then he broke down. I knew what he meant, it was his marriage that was over. He had tried desperately, bravely to save it, but she had made her choice. He was heartbroken. You may ask, where is God's sovereignty in that? This is how I responded. Human sin led to the breakup of this home. God could have, but did not intervene in a miraculous way. Nothing that has happened that night was outside of the reach of God's sovereign care. Nothing. And my friend was not outside of the will of God. But he was hurting. He was struggling. But God was still at work. And he was going to use this painful experience to teach and mold my friend to be a better Christian man if he would submit to the sovereignty of God. But what if my friend decided to get angry at God and shake his fist at God and rebel and say, God, if you can't answer my prayers and do any better than this, I don't want anything to do with you. What if he decided to walk away from faith, from prayer, from serving to the, to, and from serving the Lord? It's funny, but those who rebel like this usually do so in the name of freedom. That they want to be free. But those who rebel like this almost always end up enslaved to sin. Chained to some addiction. Locked in resentment and guilt. In regret, anger, and bitterness. There is no freedom to be found in rebellion against God. It only leads to slavery. Freedom is found in submission to God. When we say to Him, You're God and I'm not. I don't understand, but you do. Praise and glory be to your name. I submit to your sovereign will. And I need you. Our basic problem is we've not allowed God to be everywhere in our lives especially on the throne of our lives but the only place he wants to be is on the throne of our lives and what is required of us is that we repent 
and we come to Him in repentance and in His grace and mercy, He will accept us. He will love us. He may not make the pain and the difficulty go away, but He will be with you until the end of the age. I'm so thankful to say He's God and I'm not. Would you bow with me as we pray? We worship You, Almighty God. There's none like You. Before Your sovereign throne, we bow our hearts and we acknowledge Your absolute sovereignty. We beg for Your forgiveness for when we try to take life and act as our own God. Forgive us of our idolatry and make us whole in Your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone here has made a faith commitment that Jesus Christ is Lord and then seeks to live that commitment. And it begins by acknowledging you are God and we are not. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. I would ask you to stand, please, for our benediction. I would remind you of the uh, boxes in the foyer. There also is an offering plate on the table in the foyer. And there are things, hand cleaner and other things if you need them. Please practice social distancing. Let's don't relax our guard. Let's continue to be careful so that when we gather together, we don't hurt each other in that way. For our benediction tonight, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.